<laughs> and you're on. <laughs> All right, so the first sacrament, and probably the one that I'm definitely going to spend more time on, uh, that we're going to go over tonight, is the Sacrament of Holy Orders. Uh, it's one of the two sacraments in the service of communion, which means Holy Orders and marriage are the two sacraments of vocation. They're also called the two sacraments of commitment. These two sacraments are vocations that people devote their lives to in the service of building up the body of Christ, which is the church. The Sacrament of Holy Orders specifically is the sacrament of apostolic ministry, and I'll get into what that means in a little while. Looking through the letters of St. Paul in the New Testament, many of which constitute the earliest works, the earliest written books of the New Testament, one can see that the Catholic hierarchy that we have today began to form at a very early date in the life of the church. In Paul's pastoral letters to Timothy and Titus, for instance, we find a well-established hierarchy of episcopoi, bishops, presbyters, priests, and deacons. In the Acts of the Apostles, we can look at the beginnings of the diaconate with St. Stephen and the story of his martyrdom by St. Paul and the other Jews who stoned him to death. Granted, these sacred offices didn't look like what we have today at the beginnings uh, and they didn't possess all the same functions and theological meaning that, that they have today. But the Catholic Church has nevertheless always believed and taught that Jesus Christ instituted the priesthood, particularly when he told his apostles at the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me in relation to the Holy Eucharist. In the centuries and millennia to follow, a deeper theological understanding of this priesthood and of the diaconate would develop over time as the Holy Spirit would aid and guide the church to unravel, to, to pull apart more and more of what the divine revelation meant that was first given to the disciples by Jesus himself. So I guess before we go any further, a question kind of arises. Why is it called Holy Orders? It seems like kind of an odd name for a sacrament. Well, the term order refers to an established civil body, particularly a governing body in ancient Rome. The term ordination then means incorporation into such a body, in this case, the holy governing body within the church known as the hierarchy. For the foundation of the sacrament though, the one priesthood of Jesus Christ is that foundation for the sacrament of holy orders. And if you want to learn more about this foundation, the priesthood of Christ, all you have to really do is take a look at the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, which is basically focused on Jesus' priesthood. Even though there's one priesthood of Jesus Christ, there are two distinct participations in this priesthood. First, we have the common priesthood of the baptized or the faithful. And then we have the ministerial priesthood, also called the sacred priesthood of Jesus Christ. Both belong to this one priesthood of Christ, but they're two distinct ways of sharing and participating in it. And that's something that we'll highlight as I go along. But by definition, a priest is one who offers sacrifice. Both participations in Christ's priesthood offer sacrifices, but they're sacrifices of, of a different kind and they're in different roles within the church. So something that we'll get into pretty shortly is when I talk about the baptismal priesthood, every Christian by virtue of his or her baptism shares in the priesthood of Christ in that particular way. One manifestation of that participation is a tradition in the church called the morning offering, which is a prayer that many Catholics say at the beginning of their day. Uh, for instance, it goes, O Jesus, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I offer you all my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings of this day for the intentions of my family and friends, in thanksgiving for the graces you've given me, in reparation for my sins, um, along those lines. And that's something that, that every Christian by virtue of baptism can do, which is really profound to think about. Um, all the things that we go through on a daily basis, whether they're sufferings, 
whether they're joys, all the, the prayers that we pray, we can offer those up to Christ in his priesthood. And we can offer them up for our own intentions and also for the intentions of others within the church and throughout the world. Then, before I go further into that, we're going to turn for a second to the priesthood of Jesus Christ, the sacred priesthood that I mentioned. Now, the sacred priesthood, the ministerial priesthood of Christ, was prefigured and foreshadowed in the Old Testament. So this goes back thousands and thousands of years into the history of ancient Israel. Uh, we talk about the Levitical priesthood. If you ever look into the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in the, the first books of the Old Testament, you'll see a lot about the establishment of this Levitical priesthood in the person of Aaron, who was the, the brother of Moses. Now, this Levitical priesthood, along with what was called the institution of 70 elders, again, this is a very specific event in the Old Testament, but at one point, God actually appointed 70 elders to assist Moses in governing the people of Israel. And these 70 elders were given a share in Moses' power and authority. So you have these instances within the first books of the Old Testament that kind of give a hint or like a, an early image of what would later come with the priesthood of Christ. As I mentioned before, Aaron and Moses obviously had a very prominent role in the history of ancient Israel. Israel itself as a nation was made a holy nation and a royal priesthood by God. They were appointed to offer sacrifice to God amidst all the nations of the world. And if you recall, there were 12 tribes to the nation of Israel. And one of those tribes, the tribe of Levi, was set apart to minister before the Lord in God's dwelling place among his people which was first just a meeting tent, but then as time went on, it became the temple of Solomon, the great temple in Jerusalem. And this tribe of Levi was in charge with serving the Lord, with ministering before him in this temple, in this tabernacle. So Aaron and his descendants and these Levites served the Lord and the people of Israel by offering to God the numerous different sacrifices in, rep in reparation for the sins of the people in an effort to try to bring them closer into deeper communion with God. Those of the tribe of Levi, unlike all of their Israelite brothers and sisters in the other tribes, had no apportioned inheritance. They had no land to call their own because the Lord himself was their inheritance. And the Lord provided for them, provided for the Levites, out of the sacrifices that other people offered at the temple. So, this priesthood of the Old Covenant prefigured and foreshadowed the priesthood of the New Covenant. But despite that, the priesthood of the Old Covenant with Aaron and the Levites, the people of Israel, was ultimately powerless to restore communion between God and his people. His people who so often strayed from him, his people that so often rebelled against him and fell into idolatry of different kinds. So this Old Priesthood could never bring salvation. And again, if you read some of the books in the New Testament, like the book of Hebrews and the letters of Paul, that is very strongly emphasized by the earliest Christians. So the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was unique. And the pre Jesus Christ was the priest who himself was pure and spotless. Unlike all the other priests of the Old Covenant who were sinners, Jesus Christ was sinless. He was the sinless high priest, pure and spotless, and he offered his sacrifice once and for all on the cross, on Calvary. He, he offered his own body, his own body and soul, his own body and blood, soul and divinity, as we speak of in the Eucharist. He offered himself in sacrifice, not just for his own people, but for all of humanity. And so this was a very special sacrifice that came to fulfill and accomplish everything that the old sacrifices failed to do. So his sacrifice on the cross 2,000 years ago on Calvary was once and for all, it was unique. But in the plan of God, it continues to be made present throughout history in the Catholic Church, the church Jesus founded upon the apostles. 
The sacrifice of the Mass, which we've already talked about many times uh, in this RCIA process, makes really, truly, and substantially present Jesus Christ and everything that he has done for us in the plan of redemption. So it makes present his saving sacrifice on the cross, which happened 2,000 years ago. It's not a reenactment, but a representation, a, con a continuance, a, a perpetuation through time of this one sacrifice. And so the Mass is offered and celebrated every day in all of the Catholic churches throughout the whole world so that people of all times and places can share in the merits and the graces of Jesus' one sacrifice. The whole church offers this sacrifice for the glory of God and for the salvation of the whole world in and through the ministry of the sacred ministerial priesthood. Which brings me to the effects of this sacrament. What does this sacrament do exactly? Well, by virtue of baptism, as I've already mentioned, we're made into a royal priesthood and share in Christ's identity as priest, prophet, and king. This occurs because those who are baptized, those of you here who are already baptized, this has already happened to, and those of you who are to be baptized at the Easter Vigil will experience this. When you're baptized, you're sealed with an indelible mark, a, a spiritual character on your soul that can never be erased, that's permanent, not just for this life, but for the life to come. And so in that way, Baptism is like a rite of passage because there is no going back once you're baptized. You are changed forever, and you are conformed in this way to Christ. This happens at confirmation as well, which many of you will also be receiving uh, at this Easter vigil. And that's why these two sacraments can never be administered temporarily, like Oh, I'm just going to baptize him for the next few months, and then we're just going to do away with it. That's not possible with these sacraments. They can never be temporarily given to someone, and they can never be repeated. Once they happen, they happen for good. So this incredible mark is a change in the person's very identity on the deepest level, the level of being. When you were baptized, you were changed forever and came to share in this royal priesthood of Christ. The sacrament of holy orders has its own indelible mark, its own spiritual character, its own special gift of the Holy Spirit given to men called to the sacred priesthood so that they can exercise the sacred ministries that they do in the name and in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the head and the shepherd of the church. The same permanent change in being occurs with deacons as well who are called to assist the sacred priesthood in the liturgy, in the proclamation of the word, uh, proclaiming the gospel and preaching, and in works of charity. So we're talking about one sacrament, but within that sacrament, there's also three different degrees, as I've already mentioned. There's the bishops making up the episcopate, there's the priests making up the presbyterate, and then there's the deacons, which make up the diaconate. So there's three degrees in one sacrament. Going back to what was said about the role of the priest of the new covenant, the priest of Jesus Christ, the ministerial priesthood isn't just some nice add-on for the church that allows it to function more smoothly or effectively. It's much more than that. The sacred priesthood, on the contrary, in the plan of God decreed in Jesus Christ, is absolutely necessary for the life of the church and the salvation of the world. Each degree of holy orders fulfills a very special role within the church. So first, the first degree is bishops, as I've already mentioned. We have bishops who we Catholics believe are, the, are truly the successors of the apostles. Such men are ordained in what's called the apostolic line of succession, meaning that one bishop is ordained by another bishop, who was ordained by another bishop, who was ordained by another bishop, and this continues all the way back to the apostles themselves, who Christ called and chose. 
Apart from the Catholic Church, the only other Christian churches in the world who possess this apostolic succession are the Orthodox churches, the, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, meaning that the Orthodox churches are the only other churches who possess all seven valid sacraments. That's important to remember. And it's important to emphasize in our culture today, especially because we're so often indifferent to differing religions and traditions and creeds. While it's certainly true that Protestant Christians and their ministers contribute very much to the work of the church throughout the whole world in bringing people to Jesus Christ, Protestant bishops are not the same as Catholic and Orthodox bishops, nor are Protestant ministers and preachers the same as Catholic and Orthodox priests. They differ not only in what they do in ministry and in the traditions they belong to, but they differ by their very nature because of the sacrament of holy orders of what it does to these men and because of apostolic succession, as I've already mentioned. The bishops, as successors of the apostles, possess the fullness of the sacred priesthood and thus are changed and empowered by Christ above all others in the church to proclaim the gospel to the whole world, to teach the Christian faith in its fullness, to shepherd the people of God both as a whole and in the particular churches they are over. Like Archbishop Lurie, the particular church that he's in charge of is the Archdiocese of Baltimore. And to sanctify the people of God through prayer and the administration of the sacraments. So we have this threefold function of teaching, sanctifying, and governing the church. Within this apostolic line and ministry, certain bishops throughout the centuries are chosen by God and elected to become popes. The pope, in addition to being the bishop of Rome, as Pope Francis so often says, is also the vicar or the representative of Christ on earth and the shepherd of the universal church, not just of any one diocese, but of the whole church throughout the world. The care of all the churches in the world are given to him by Christ. The Pope is therefore the chief guardian of the faith on earth, along with his brother bishops, who are entrusted with preserving intact the deposit of faith, which is everything that's been divinely revealed by Jesus Christ through scripture and tradition. The Pope is also the visible sign of unity in the church throughout the world, which in turn, the, the church is the visible sign of unity of the entire human race. The sacred power that bishops are given in the sacrament of holy orders is only to be exercised in communion with the whole college of bishops, with all the bishops throughout the globe, and with the Pope, who is the head of that college. Likewise, the sacred power that priests receive in the same sacrament can only be exercised in communion with their bishops. For deacons, the special strength that they are given in the same sacrament is also only to be exercised under the direction of their bishops. And so we have this sort of pattern in holy orders. Through the sacrament itself, Christ imparts the grace and power, but that power and that grace is not a free-for-all. There are parameters on how it's to be used, how it's to be exercised. It's always to be exercised in communion. That's important to remember. So we, then we come to the second degree of holy orders, which are priests. Priests are co-workers of the bishops in their apostolic ministry. Before I get ahead of myself, this is probably a good time to mention that although there were three degrees of the sacrament, there are only two distinct sharings in the sacred ministerial priesthood of Christ. Only bishops and priests are part of this sacred priesthood. Deacons are still part of the priesthood of the baptized or the common priesthood, but they are consecrated or set apart to serve the church in their own distinct way and to assist the sacred priesthood, which is at the service of the priesthood of the baptized. And so both distinct participations in Christ's priesthood are ordered to one another. So you can't have one without the other. They both exist together, and they both exist to help one another. 
It might sound a little confusing at first, I know, but hopefully over time it'll make more sense for you. In the big picture of God's design, priests are those men within the church who are called from among the people of God to serve the people of God in the name and person of Jesus Christ. And this is what is meant by the phrase in persona Christi Capitus. In their ministry, priests both help the baptized to live out their own particular sharing in the priesthood of Christ, and they also bring the baptized to their true home in heaven, in the sacred ministry that's proper to them. So, taking a step back to think about all this, one might ask, well, why do we need priests if we have, if we have baptism? The answer on one hand is pretty simple and profound. Because we need Jesus, the church needs her founder, the bride needs her bridegroom, the body needs its head. Priests are ordained to work with the bishops in bringing the world to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ to the world and to his people. The priest takes upon himself the sacrificial offerings of the people of God, especially in the Mass, and unites them with that one sacrifice of Christ that I mentioned before. In this sanctifying work, Jesus uses priests to make of his church a pure and acceptable sacrifice to the Father. Without the sacred priesthood, we would have never have heard the gospel in the first place. We would not have the sacraments, especially the Most Holy Eucharist, and we would not have the sacrifice of the Mass, which, as stated in the Second Vatican Council, is the source and summit of all Christian life. Through his priests, Jesus continues to become visibly and really present to the people he has called to himself, and indeed to the whole world. In a powerful way, the sacred priesthood is an extension of the incarnation of Christ, the word becoming flesh and living among us. Through the priesthood, we also have the great extension of this mystery, the most holy Eucharist, which is the real bodily presence of Christ on earth. The third and final degree of holy orders is the diaconate. Deacons are ordained to serve in assisting the priestly order in the work of ministry for the people of God, receiving a special character through the sacrament of holy orders to strengthen them for that task. And deacons perform a number of different tasks. This is something that I've been learning about as I've been drawing close to my own ordination. Uh, they assist at and bless marriages. They officiate at funeral rites. They obviously have a, a larger role in assisting in the Mass, assisting the priest. They assist in distributing Holy Communion. They preach and they pro proclaim the Gospel. And they also engage in works of charity and administration in the life of the Church as well. So priests really do an awful lot in the life of the Church. And they do a lot to help both the people and the priests and the bishops whom they serve. So, in conclusion with this sacrament, there's such a grandeur to the priesthood, but there's also such an unworthiness to the people called to it. And this is something that we've kind of faced up against in recent times with all the scandals that we've seen. Um, scandals both of a financial nature and also, of course, of a sexual nature, too. And it's left a real scar on the church. It's left a real scar on the priesthood. Certainly a lot of people would probably think that I'm nuts for going into this uh, amidst all the scandal, amidst all the challenges that I'll be facing um, as a priest. But there really is a great passage in the catechism that I'd like to, to read to you that kind of sums it up pretty well. It's by St. Gregory of Nazianzus. And he gave this quote when he was a very young priest himself. He says, we must begin by purifying ourselves before purifying others. We must be instructed to be able to instruct, become light to illuminate, draw close to God to bring him close to others, be sanctified to sanctify, lead by the hand and counsel prudently. I know whose ministers we are, 
where we find ourselves and to where we strive. I know God's greatness and man's weakness, but also his potential. Who then is the priest? He is the defender of truth, who stands with angels, gives glory with archangels, causes sacrifices to rise to the altar on high, shares Christ's priesthood, refashions creation, restores it in God's image, recreates it for the world on high, and even greater is divinized and divinizes. So even in the midst of so much failure within those who have holy orders, Christ continues to impart this grace for the good of his whole church and for the good of the whole world. You never take away human weakness, but the grace of the sacrament and grace in God's plan through this is always present, uh, even despite that. Um, before I get too carried away, I guess I should probably get to the, the second sacrament tonight, which is anointing of the sick. Anointing of the sick is one of the two sacraments of healing, along with the sacrament of confession. It was once called extreme unction, which some of you might remember, I'm not sure. Uh, it was called this for a long time in the church's history because of the, the increasing tendency of the sacrament to be given only to those who were at the point of death. But since Vatican II, the sacrament has been renamed anointing of the sick to emphasize its broader application to the faithful and the church's belief in the possibility of miraculous healing if it was deemed by God to be conducive to the person's salvation. This sacrament is still administered with very special importance and urgency to those who are near death, but it's now also administered to all those who are about to undergo surgery and to those who have serious or chronic illnesses. Perhaps some of you have been to healing masses. I know a lot of parishes have that. I'm not sure if the Basilica has uh, those. The Archbishop of Florida is actually going to have a healing, an honor of healing or something. I guess Kathy, you might know that. But what, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah, so February 14th, 1045 mass. They probably won't, but they'll be praying for the sick. And, uh, but there are masses in the archdiocese. You know, they'll, at, at some point in the mass, they'll invite anyone who wants to come up to be anointed. You know, like Kyle said, anyone who's facing surgery, anyone who has chronic illness, anyone who really feels that they need the sacrament for any kind of illness. Or, you know, you can just call your local priest. We've done that before or after the 1210 mass um, for folks who, who asked that. It's, it's very powerful. Stuff. I've had it several times because I've had several surgeries each time I've asked for the anointing of the sick. Just to feel like, you know, I mean, God's hands and, and all will be well. I know a lot of what I've said so far is pretty heady, pretty intellectual, because most of it actually comes from the catechism. Um, but on the experiential level, I, I would say that if you ever have the opportunity uh, to go to the sacrament of anointing of the sick, either for yourself or even for other people, because it's, it's a liturgical event, even, even if it's given to a single person in a private setting, uh, it's often encouraged for other people in the vicinity to partake in the celebration of that sacrament. And it really is a powerful experience of, of healing. Um, and also, the same goes for ordination. Um, before I finish talking about holy orders, it's, it'd be a great opportunity for any of you to, to go to an ordination, either for deacons or priests, because that, too, is a very powerful experience uh, in the life of the church. But back to anointing of the sick, uh, Jesus is instituting this sacrament is alluded to in Mark's gospel when Jesus sends out his apostles to proclaim the gospel, heal the sick with oils, and drive out demons in his name and by his power and authority. But it's in the letter of James, who's called the brother of the Lord, 
that this sacrament is laid out in greater detail in the sacred scriptures. I just want to read you a passage there that pretty much clarifies that. St. James says in his letter, Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders, the presbyters, of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So that's from the New Testament, and it actually gives a pretty good summary of the layout of the sacrament that we have. Uh, Jesus' preferential love and his compassion for those who are ill and dying can be seen throughout the Gospels. I mean, many, I'd say most of the miracles that he performs are on those who are sick, those who are dying, those who are possessed in, in cases of spiritual uh, sickness. And this compassion and love that he has for the ill, for the sick, continues today in the sacrament of healing that we're talking about now, which he's entrusted to his church through the ministry of bishops and priests who are the valid ministers of this sacrament. But there's so much more I could probably say about this sacrament, but the one thing that's probably the most important to remember is this. The effects of the sacrament, which reveal the nature and the purpose of it, are very important to, to understand. Anointing of the sick provides to the person receiving the sacrament a particular gift of the Holy Spirit, namely strength to undergo and persist through suffering in a Christian manner. To understand this, one needs to realize the Catholic Christian understanding of suffering. In the Paschal Mystery, the Passion, Death, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord gave suffering a new meaning and a new power. Because Jesus freely entered into suffering for our sake, because he took the cross upon his shoulders with all of its shame and pain, he shared once and for all in our suffering, he entered into it enabling us to draw closer to him in and through the pains that we endure. Anointing of the sick first and foremost gives the person the grace of uniting his or her suffering to the suffering of Christ, and so draw close to him amidst the darkest moments of human existence. But the sacrament also gives the person an ecclesial grace, the grace by which the person's suffering is lifted up to the Lord for the salvation of his people, for the whole church. This is really amazing to think about, since those who are ill and dying so often feel helpless, abandoned by everyone, and really passive in what they're going through. They feel like they're just victims that are kind of being tormented by whatever they're experiencing. Well, this sacrament has the power to change all of that. The person is united in this sacrament with all those in the church who are praying for them, who are suffering with them, and who are deeply concerned for them. But the person's suffering also becomes redemptive in and of itself by the grace of this sacrament. This says a whole lot about daily sufferings that we are faced all the time. When we suffer and when we offer up our pains to the Lord, he can and does use it for the salvation of all. Thus, one suffering can be spiritually productive, not just for our own betterment and our own salvation, but for others in a way that really goes beyond our understanding. And so this kind of understanding of suffering is so key to understanding this sacrament. And as I mentioned before, uh, the church clearly believes as well that the sacrament does have the potential to miraculously heal that person in body and in soul if God deems that conducive to the person's salvation. So it's not a necessary outcome. When a person is anointed, it's not automatically a healing in body as well as in soul. But it can be if God wills that for the person's own salvation, if he deems it necessary for the person's salvation, the salvation of the soul, that can and does happen with this sacrament. So in conclusion, anointing of the sick is the sacrament that accompanies the sacrament of penance, of confession, as a sacrament of healing, 
But if a sick and dying person for some reason didn't have the opportunity to go to confession, anointing of the sick actually brings with it absolution. It brings with it the forgiveness of sins, uh, which is another benefit, another grace that this sacrament brings with it. Along with the Holy Eucharist as viaticum, which, which means food for the way, these sacraments mark the completion of what began in baptism. The completion of that anointing that was given at baptism and confirmation, and the completion of that earthly journey that we're all on towards the heavenly kingdom. And so anointing of the sick, obviously it's tied to the sacrament of holy orders because priests and bishops are the ones who administer the sacrament. But in a more profound way, it's tied to all of the other sacraments, as is holy orders. Holy orders, in some sense, is sort of the provider of those other sacraments. That's the way that, that God, in and through Jesus Christ, provides the other sacraments for his church. And anointing of the sick kind of pulls it all together at the end of life, especially amidst suffering. And so that's something that's very important to remember. And I know that I didn't really get to it in the course of my presentation, but um, I have a few books here with me. In case any of you want to look at these, I just kind of glanced through them. This big book is called The Roman Pontifical. It has all the rites of ordination inside of it. And I've actually been using and praying with it quite a bit to kind of prepare for my own ordination to the diaconate. But this has the rites of ordination for bishops, priests, and deacons. So if you want to kind of flip through this, it really is kind of interesting and profound. Because um, you're seeing a lot of the prayers that are used in ordinations. You see a lot of the history of the sacrament of holy orders. And you see what constitutes the sacrament. The laying on of hands by the bishop and the prayer that he says. So that's one thing that all of you are more than welcome to, to look at. I guess I can put it here for now. Uh, the other book that I wanted to kind of invite you all to look at is this little book called The Pastoral Care of the Sick. This is the main book that's used in anointing of the sick. And so it details the rite of that sacrament. And it act this copy of it actually has it in English and Spanish. Um, so if any of you would like to look through that as well, it kind of details what anointing of the sick is, what the rite looks like. Uh, it kind of goes into greater depth with viaticum that I mentioned there at the end. Um, so that's another thing that you're more than welcome and encouraged to, to look at. And if any of you are curious about the priesthood, obviously I have a lot of resources on that. But I decided to bring just a few books that I've kind of read through in my own discernment, my own formation. Uh, the first one is To Save a Thousand Souls which is more of a book for those actually discerning the call, but it's, it's a good educational book for anyone who wants to learn more about uh, the Sacrament of Holy Orders. The second one is probably a more well-known one, Priest for the Third Millennium by Cardinal Timothy Dolan. Uh, excellent book on the priesthood. And a, another smaller book, this is a really short, easy read, uh, but a, a good kind of summary of the priesthood and why it's important. Uh, Many Are Called, which is written by Scott Hahn. So I'll just kind of leave these here uh, for any of those, any of you who are interested in looking at those as well. Um, that, that pretty much sums up the, the two sacraments. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, what's the theme, anointing of the sick and last rites? Well, if there is any. Last rites is. It's the sacrament of anointing of the sick that's given to a person at the point of death. Uh, last rites is a, a name that was used a lot more in previous uh, centuries in the life of the church. Anointing of the sick like, is like the name for the sacrament now that we use, but last rites kind of refers to the application of the sacrament to someone who's on their deathbed. Um, and last rites would include not just anointing of the sick, but that would include uh, penance and also viaticum, uh, receiving the Eucharist one last time before making that journey to heaven, to eternal life. So, good question, though. I have a question. 
So uh, it's only, why is it only men that are priests? Well, that is a, a very good uh, and question. And briefly, just briefly. Good question that comes up a lot, especially in our culture. Uh, we seem to be kind of obsessed with the question, but it's a good one. Um, one thing I didn't touch on in my presentation is the fact that holy, uh, holy orders is the one sacrament among the seven that isn't a rite. And by right, I mean R-I-G-H-T, not R-I-T-E. Um, I'm not sure if uh, many of you realize that, but the, the sacraments of the church, people actually have a right to those. People have a right to baptism, to confirmation, to the Eucharist, to confession, to anointing of the sick. They have a right, they have a right to marriage. So there's a right to all of these sacraments except for holy orders. Holy orders is the only sacrament that people don't have a right to. And so I think that's important to realize, especially amid the current debates, because it's often put in that context like, well, why don't women have a right to the priesthood? Well, understanding the nature of the sacrament itself, it's not a right. It's actually a privilege. Um, I don't have a right to the priesthood. I'm in the process of discernment and formation, but I don't have a right to say to the bishop, well, you have to make me a priest. This is something that they have to accept. They have to accept my application to the seminary. They have to evaluate me along the whole process. And it's the church in the person of the bishop who actually calls me to holy orders. So it's not something that I just say, well, I'm gonna take this. It's something that's given as a gift and as a privilege. Um, but I guess a more simple answer would be that the church has always respected the decision of her founder, of Jesus Christ. And we know from throughout all of history that Jesus Christ did not call women to holy orders, what we call holy orders now. The apostles, the 12 apostles who are the successors, or my, my bad, the 12 apostles that Jesus chose, of course, were all men, and they had a very special place in the life of the church. The bishops being their successors, and priests being ordained by the bishops, deacons being ordained by the bishops. So you have this apostolic line that has always been of men. So, I mean, there, there could be something said to the, to the point of, well, because a priest is configured to the person of Christ in such an intimate way, Christ's manhood has to be an expression of that sacrament. Something can be said of that, but ultimately, really, it is the church's long-standing respect for the choice of Christ in, in this. And people that pose that question and debate about it also have to understand that women clearly have a very noble place in the church as well. I mean, for instance, I'm never able to be a mother, obviously, <laughs> but I don't think of myself as any less important in the life of the church. Being a mother is a very noble vocation, a very noble calling. So we all have distinct callings. We all have distinct vocations. Um, so I guess that'd be kind of some way of trying to explain that. Um, you could go into a lot greater detail, but uh, just kind of for the time being, maybe that will suffice. Are there any other questions on either of the two sacraments? I, I know I kind of had to rush through them with the time that we have, but. Um, Very good. Excellent presentation. And maybe if you single men in here, you could um, give those, those priest books to the career. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if, if, if any of you want to borrow them, to be honest, you're, you're free to, to borrow them. Uh, they're, they're all excellent reads. Uh, for 